Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 22nd of May. As always, this is useful. A like and subscribe is appreciated. A pretty quiet week. I think obviously we have Build next week. If you've not registered, go register. It's free. So there'll be a lot of announcements there. Even though it's more app dev focused, there's still announcements that will impact the infrastructure side. As always, we have the chapters down below. New videos this week. I created a video all about reserved instances and the on-demand capacity reservations. Understanding what they are, how they differ, how to use them together. And then a brand new feature this week, which I'm about to talk about, Azure DNS Private Resolver. Solving some of the challenges we had in the past about from outside Azure resolving Azure Private DNS zone entries and then from Azure DNS, being able to forward particular zones to other DNS servers. So this is going to fix both of those. On the compute side, there was a big Kubernetes conference. So a number of AKS related announcements. Firstly, host process containers for Windows. So when I think about a host process, I think a privileged container. It enables more Kubernetes cluster management scenarios on Windows. It behaves like a regular process as if it was running directly on the host. So those are now in preview. Bring your own CNI plugins for AKS. So I think about a container network interface. And by default, Kubernetes doesn't provide a network interface. We're used to the idea of KubeNet for very basic networking or the Azure CNI for more advanced scenarios. But what I can now do is I can deploy my AKS cluster without any CNI, without any network plugin. And then I can deploy almost any commercial or open source CNI, which would give me consistency on the networking, both for AKS in Azure and for my Kubernetes outside of Azure. Open Service Mesh for Azure Arc has gone GA. So when I think about, remember Azure Arc for Kubernetes brings those Azure control plane, those capabilities to really any CNCF capable and compatible Kubernetes offering. It then can be managed via the Azure Arc for Kubernetes. And Open Service Mesh is a managed service mesh. It's lightweight. It's extensible. It injects an Envoy proxy sidecar to each application instance. And with that sidecar, we get capabilities like um, MTLS encryption between the microservices. So, hey, I want encrypted traffic between all of my pods. This does that. I can have traffic splitting. So I have canary deployment patterns. I have blue green. This lets me, hey, split a certain amount of traffic depending on that deployment pattern. I can have fine-grained access policies, observability, and much more. So that's now GA for my Azure Arc managed Kubernetes. AKS etcd integrations. Remember, etcd is that database we have for Kubernetes. It's managed. But what we can do is we can have secrets that get stored in that etcd database. And what this now brings is through this capability, I can have my KMS plugin for Azure Key Vault. So the key is stored in my Azure Key Vault that's going to get used to encrypt the etcd database and the secrets within it. So basically bringing my own key for the encryption of that etcd database. There's now PLS integration for AKS. So PLS is the private link service. And this is all about the idea that ordinarily, when I have a deployment to Kubernetes, I can say, hey, I want an internal load balancer. And that can just be part of my manifest I pass. And it goes and creates that internal load balancer, links it up to my services. I don't have to do anything. Well, then for a standard load balancer, I can attach a private link service to it, which then enables me to have private endpoints in other VNets connect to that private link service to talk to the service. I get natting. I don't have to peer the networks. Well, previously, I would have to go and create that private link service after the fact. But what this is letting me do now as part of that service manifest file, I can add the private link service just like adding an internal load balancer. If we go and quickly look at the documentation, what we will see 
is we now just have those extra annotations. So I can see, hey, private link service annotations. And we're talking about, well, hey, Azure PLS create true. Then there are other settings as well I go through, but the key point now is just within that single manifest that I use to deploy my service, just like the Azure load balancer before, there were annotations for that, go and create the resource. Now I can add the PLS to it as well. And then we had CSI extensible API. So when I think about the container storage interface, now through this API, I can enable, disable any AKS supported CSI driver. So I can grab a file and disk, I now have complete control over those. On the networking side, I talked about this already, the Azure DNS private resolver has gone preview. So I had a whole video deep diving into that, but it's really there to address those two scenarios I talked about. Hey, DNS servers outside of an Azure virtual network wanna be able to resolve um, Azure, Azure private DNS zones linked to a VNet. This solves that through an inbound endpoint. And from Azure DNS, I wanna be able to forward to other DNS servers for other zones. Well, there's an outbound endpoint that facilitates that. And then there's a whole set of forwarding rules that I can link to different VNets that enable a really great set of functionality. On the database side, so Azure Stream Analytics now has managed identity support. So if I think about Stream Analytics wanting to talk to other services, this could be Azure Cosmos DB, Azure Service Bus. Well, the managed identity is just that either system assigned, so it's automatically managed, and then Azure Stream Analytics can use that to have permissions to my Cosmos DB, to my service bus. I don't have to worry about maintaining that identity, or it can be user assigned. Hey, I'm gonna separately manage the life cycle of this user assigned managed identity, give it permissions, and then give a particular instance of Azure Stream Analytics the right to use that user assigned managed identity. The user assigned is useful if maybe I have multiple resources that need the same sets of permissions to other resources. So hey, they can use the same user assigned managed identity. So it really helps minimize that credential handling, credential storage. Um, I also get resiliency with managed identity. They're longer lived tokens. They're automatically proactively refreshed. There's regional authentication. So on everything, not just stream analytics, use managed identity if you can. And then miscellaneous, so trusted launch VMs, these are the generation two VMs that have UEFI based firmware. They expose things like the virtual TPM. When I turn on trusted launch, it's giving me secure boot. So from that virtual UEFI, a secure path all the way to the OS, an attestation of that um, proven secure path. Well now I can back them up with Azure Backup. There's still a few limitations around backup center manageability. I imagine those will get cleared up over time, but now we can at least back them up using Azure Backup. And that's it. So as always, I hope this was useful. And until next video, take care.